Welcome back to Otaku Daikun. Dai here. Today, we'll be continuing my guide through the Tsukihime remake so that folks who can't speak Japanese can still enjoy this beautiful novel. We're gonna dive right on in after a brief recap. Last we left off, Shiki went into Vlav's lair and discovered how both Noel and CL are agents of the burial agency. Vlav emerged, using his idea blood to create a deadly blizzard that CL contained within a barrier. If she lost their fight, the city would be destroyed. Shiki tried to get Arcoade's help, and in general she refused to ally with the church, but did protect the city in the end. CL and Shiki slayed Vlav, though Shiki came out injured. Another church figure, Mario, arrived with his team to handle the cover-up. He has Noel wrapped around his finger. The next morning, Shiki wakes up peacefully in his bed, almost as if nothing had happened. Again, Hisui scares the shit out of him with her sneakiness. I am very, very sneaky, sir. She's come to tell him Akiha needs to talk about his absence these past two days. When Shiki asks about how he got to bed, she tells him he came home on his own past 10 p.m. and told Kohaku he was so tired he had to go straight to sleep. Shiki doesn't remember doing that, and reason CL must have dropped him off outside the mansion, and his memory is just hazy because of how exhausted he was. That said, he still has his memories of last night's battle. Vlav is dead, and hopefully the city will go back to normal. His body still feels the strain from last night, too. He can feel the pain from his injuries, and due to using his eyes, he has a headache. Shiki changes his clothes and heads to the sitting room, deciding there's no way he can tell Akiha the truth about what's been going on. He doesn't want her involved in anything dangerous, after all. He won't lie, either, so he ultimately tells her that he's unable to tell her about his absence, insisting he wasn't doing anything wrong and that he's sorry for worrying her. Trusting him, Akiha reluctantly drops the issue. Even so, she's pissed he didn't contact her, considering how dangerous it is in the city at night. Shiki remarks how the vampire killings should be over, saying the culprit has been caught. Happy to put such things behind him, he tries to go get some breakfast, but feels lightheaded upon standing up. Akiha insists that he have a visit with Dr. Araku, since she happens to be at the mansion today. Shiki asks if he'll have to take off his clothes for the exam, making Akiha flustered. Nope, just removing the shirt will do. Akiha has obligations to tend to, so she leaves him alone in the sitting room. About ten minutes later, Araku bursts through the door, eccentric as always. Her wild personality deters him, especially when she insists he strip down to his undies. She may not be drunk, but she's high on endorphins since last night, offering to give him a special examination. Joking aside, she proves to be rather skilled with his treatment. She immediately recognizes his body is in bad shape, damaged both internally and externally. She treats it with a combination of ointments for inflammation and an IV drip for nutrients. She inquires about how he got his injuries, agreeing to keep it a secret from Akiha since he addresses her as Hakase, like a real doctor. Since it's clear he's been in a fight, she asks if he knows anyone else who's injured. Despite being hit much harder, CL appeared to be doing just fine. Noel, on the other hand, actually suffered a bite from Vlav, but he insists he was the only one hurt. After lunch, when he's finished with his IV treatment, Shiki decides to visit CL at her apartment. Even though she's supposed to leave after completing her mission, he figures he can catch her since it's only been half a day. He passes by the ruins of last night's battle and rings the doorbell at CL's place. Sadly, there's no answer, so he decides to wander the city a bit instead. Now that Vlav is dead, he regrets not getting to say a proper goodbye to either CL or Arcoade. Despite the danger of the past two days, he's glad he got to meet the two of them. Before it gets too late, he returns to the mansion in time for dinner. There, Akiha is especially angry, arriving late herself because of family issues she had to fix. She takes her frustration out on Shiki, scolding him for goofing off in the afternoon. That night, Shiki tries to go to bed, crying from the thought that he might never see CL again. His sleep is interrupted by what he believes is a voice calling out to him. Now awake, he feels compelled to read a book from his bookshelf. The passage describes two people, one of whom is named the Serpent, discussing the immortality of dead apostles. Such beings are considered defective, unable to thrive without human blood on a regular basis. When the narrator starts talking about true, infinite immortality, it's easy to tell this is coming from Aroa's perspective. He does have the title Serpent of Akasha, after all. 
He's speaking with our absent tea dead apostle Nero Chaos. Given that this is the Wandering Sea, the branch of the Mages Association where Nero originally became a vampire. Nero's workshop is still functioning after 800 years. The two praise each other and begin scheming to work together to capture someone. Without much transition, Shiki's reading ends, and we return to the present day. At an undisclosed location, Roa finds himself bound by chains. A pair of claws rip out his heart, and the chains tighten around his throat to silence his screams. The assailant is Arcoade, who mocks him for his latest shabby reincarnation. Mario arrives too late, upset to find that Roa is already dead. We know from Arcoade's route that Mario is on a mission from his grandfather to uncover Roa's immortality research. With Roa dead, he has no way to ask about it, and if he waits around 17 years or so for the next reincarnation, it'll be too late. Either way, Roa is dead, so that's a good thing, but Mario asks if Arcoade will be okay with this. Mario knows that she can only regain the energy Roa stole from her by killing him for good. Now that her body's at its limit, she won't be able to make it to Roa's next reincarnation without succumbing to her bloodlust. That said, she still has Roa's heart, and by devouring it, she can absorb some of that lost energy. Tempted, she gazes at the heart with a twisted lust, but ultimately decides to reject it. She crushes the heart in her hand, and when its blood scatters across her face, she remarks that it tastes pathetically awful. Walking away, she leaves Mario an ominous threat, that if he ever follows her trail again, she'll kill them all. Left vague, he can't tell if she means just him and his men, the church itself, or all of its believers. All he can say for sure is that she's serious. Now, if you're anything like me, that last part may sound really confusing. Why the hell would Shiki be reading a book about Roa? As far as I'm aware, it's more of a metaphor, really. We know that Shiki Nanaya and Shiki Tono both share a bond through the energy received from Akiha in the forest clearing seven years ago. Typically, when Roa is killed, he has no choice but to move on to another host, growing up within them for several years as Arcoade mentioned. If you play the OG Tsukihime, though, you'll know that Roa can try to possess our Shiki as an extra precaution. Thus, when Shiki's reading about Roa, it's more like Roa's memories are flowing into him as he transitions into the next host. In other words, shit's gonna get dark. In that vein, Shiki wakes up feeling more healthy and energetic than usual. The dude who normally skips meals is suddenly requesting a larger breakfast, much to Hisui's surprise and delight. He can finally appreciate Kohaku's culinary skills, scarfing down her food with joy. Even so, while he doesn't tell her, he feels unsatisfied, like he's craving something less delicately prepared. Uh-oh. On the way to school, he notes that things really are returning to normal. He admits he'll miss those times at lunch with Ciel and Arihiko. Regardless, she fought to protect this boring yet peaceful life, so he puts up with it, only to spot her by the school's gate, cheerful as ever. She toys around with Shiki, avoiding the topic of vampires since they're in public. She acts like a student with every right to be at school. A flustered Shiki expends all of his energy, realizing he's just glad to see her again. Playing it cool, the two head into the building and proceed as ordinary students. Even stranger is that Noelle is back as a teacher, surprising even her colleague. Back to her perverse normal, Noelle asks how Shiki is feeling and sneaks in close with the excuse of taking his temperature. CL is forced to watch in embarrassment as Noelle playfully bites his ear. Everyone else is already in class, so this goes on until the bell rings. Noelle runs ahead, offering to explain things to Shiki after hours behind the school building. Also in a hurry, CL tells him to visit the tea ceremony club after school for details. In quite the predicament, he'll have to choose which lovely lady to visit. During lunch, Arihiko approaches him while he's pondering this decision. Shiki thanks Arihiko for covering for him back when he stayed at CL's place. Arihiko says it's no problem, but remarks how hot he thinks Akiha probably is based on the sound of her voice. As for what to actually do for lunch, Shiki chooses to look for Ciel at the tea ceremony room, hoping to cash in on his reward for fighting Vlav, a hand-cooked meal. Ditching Arihiko, he heads to the club room and knocks on the door. Ciel refuses to eat with him, reaffirming they aren't supposed to meet until after class. Prepared, he proclaims he's brought curry bread for her, and while she finds it insulting he thinks that'll work on her, it actually does. <laughs> 
She clarifies that this period will be for lunch, not vampires. So Shiki instead brings up the whole handmade bento deal. Embarrassed, she clarifies she hasn't forgotten about her promise. She tried to make a lunch, but it didn't turn out right, so she couldn't bring it with her. Instead, she asks him to think of something else as a reward. Seriously upgrading his end of the bargain, Shiki says she can repay him with her body. At first, she assumes he's asking her to help with labor or something. But when he clarifies he means skinship, she adamantly refuses, claiming they aren't close enough. She can't allow it as a member of the church. He settles for taking off her glasses, and surprisingly, CL acts like it's just as lewd. For one last pushback, she suggests they try each other's glasses on, but that really defeats the point, doesn't it? The conversation turns awkward, so Shiki drops the issue entirely. He was having fun just teasing her, and apologizes for being a perv. To that, she asks why he's interested in her. A horny teenage boy would be more likely to lust after Noel. Shiki admits that he finds CL very attractive, and that she was especially cool while fighting Vlav. He gushes about how awesome she was in her battle armor, firing a gun and swinging a massive sword like it were nothing. CL struggles to keep her composure as he showers her with praise. She doesn't really think highly of herself, but she's nonetheless grateful to hear his compliments. Putting all that aside, she demands her curry bread, derailing the conversation. They enjoy the rest of their lunch in peace, and after school, Shiki has to decide who to go visit. The obvious choice is to head right back to the tea ceremony room and talk with Ciel. It's finally time to discuss the vampire situation. She starts off by asking what Shiki's been up to, and how he wound up in Vlov's lair to begin with. He explains his partnership with Arkawade, conveniently omitting how he originally killed her. Ciel is surprised Arkawade would make a promise with a human, given how the two of them are enemies. Ciel asks if he genuinely trusts Arkawade, asserting that a true ancestor like her is considered even more of a threat than Vlav was. It becomes apparent that Arkawade hasn't told Shiki anything about Roa, their true target in the city. Taking advantage of this, Ciel also avoids mentioning Roa, and instead reasons that she and Noel are still in town to hunt down all of Vlav's subordinates, a task that'll keep them there until graduation. They also need to investigate the lair, considering it was way more elaborate than they expected. When Shiki brings it up, Ciel admits that by pretending to be a captive student, she was trying to lure Vlav out of hiding, but that plan fell apart when Shiki showed up. She can't understand why he would be fighting vampires unless Arkawade were forcing him to. Again, he refrains from mentioning his obligation to help Arkawade since he killed her. Because Ciel doesn't know about his mystic eyes, she assumes his knife is a special vampire-killing weapon. But even while having it, he should leave it to the professionals. He did incur that large shoulder wound, which she reveals she fixed by herself. Understanding her plight, Shiki agrees to leave it to her and Noel to clear the city of vampires. He's relieved to know it's all over, at least on his end anyway. Thankfully, Ciel declares she won't be erasing his memories either. By this point, he's definitely no stranger, proving himself to be more than just any civilian. All she asks in return is for him to stay out of trouble, and he agrees. Of course, that won't last long. It never does. Either way, they wrap things up on a positive note, and Shiki heads home for the day, knowing he'll have to keep Ciel's true identity a secret. Back at the mansion, Hisui greets him in the courtyard. He feels bad because she must usually wait outside for him like this, even on the days he doesn't come home. Thankfully, she agrees to wait for him in the lobby instead from now on. He orders her to take a break before dinner, while he goes up to his room to rest. Shiki nearly has a heart attack when he enters his room and finds Arkwade there waiting for him. Despite their harsh parting the other night, she's in a pleasant mood. Gleefully, she hugs him and pulls him onto the bed with her. In a panic, he squirms free and asks what she's doing here now that Vlav is dead. Joking, she claims she's here to suck his blood, but it's obvious she's just messing with him at this point. In truth, she noticed his scent while exploring and came to say hello. Frustrated, he tells her to leave before Akiha sees them. Before Arkwade can seriously explain herself, Hisui knocks at the door to check on him. Treating this worse than Vlav's attack, Shiki freaks out and tries to chase Arkwade out the window. She agrees to leave after he promises to meet her in the park at 10. Before parting, she warns Shiki that the mansion isn't safe. She says the water is contaminated. After dinner, Gohaku changes the subject of tea to talk about how Shiki acts nervously around Hisui. 
He clarifies that it's less him being nervous, and more just being careful on his toes considering how meticulous she is at tending to his every need. It tends to highlight his every inadequacy, but he appreciates how she doesn't get angry when he screws up, such as coming home late. As usual, Akiha chides him for violating curfew, and the two argue about whether to extend his evening hours more. She wisely suspects he's planning to sneak out tonight. To avoid the topic, he brings up wanting to take a bath in the East Wing, since it's supposed to be much bigger than the one on his side. On that note, he recalls Arkawade's warning, and asks if there's a problem with the mansion's water supply. Akiha hasn't noticed anything off, but Kohaku admits that since their waterworks are outdated, their underground canal can get muddy on rainy days. Makihisa never did a good job keeping up on repairs, so Akiha deems it fair to call in a contractor soon. By the time Shiki retires to his room for the night, he has less than an hour before he's supposed to meet Arkawade. Curious about what she wanted to tell him, he reluctantly drags himself out of bed, across town, and to the park. While Arkawade sparks up pleasant conversation, he's not thrilled about her stunt at the mansion. She assures him she wouldn't let herself be caught, and that she even broke the security camera to avoid detection. This devolves into their typical shouting match, with Shiki calling her an idiot. He gets her to admit that she went too far, but it's not like she was welcome just coming to the front door, either. Instinctively, Shiki tries to leave, which is unfair because he's not really giving her any viable options. Things mellow when he mentions that she stands out, not for being a vampire, but because of how pretty she is. Hearing that, she agrees to be more subtle in contacting him from now on. Getting to the point, Arkawade says that she came to see him on vampire matters. There's more hunting to do, and once more she clarifies that Vlav wasn't her main target, nor was he the main killer on the loose. After all, Vlav torched his victims, leaving behind no trace. Instead, she's been hunting Roa, a dead apostle who reincarnates over time. That said, she lets Shiki know that his fight with Vlav still had value, and that she enjoyed watching it from afar. She explains that thanks to his efforts, she was able to regain her energy and kill Roa right away. All that's left now are his underlings. Actually killing the guy, however, has made her exhausted, so she wants Shiki's help taking the small fry down. When he hesitates, she reminds him of their promise back at the condo. She would help defeat Vlav in exchange for a favor, and since she did technically help during the fight, she's here to claim her reward. Shiki agrees, and the two of them venture into the city. Vampires can be dangerous when their master is defeated. Some hide within the old lair, but others find themselves liberated, wandering off of their own volition. CL and the rest of the church will be helpful taking down the runaways, as it allows Arkawade and Shiki to seek out and kill any small gatherings. Along the way, Arkawade reveals that Roa's lair was beneath his school all this time. As they walk, Arkawade sneezes, demonstrating that even she has vulnerabilities. Blaming it on her miniskirt, Shiki offers his jacket, which she accepts enthusiastically. Filled with energy, she puts on the jacket and dances around with glee. It's so sweet he almost finds himself falling for her. The two reach a residential district and stop by the cellar of one of the buildings. Turns out, Shiki's eyes are especially good at identifying the dead from ordinary humans, so Arkwade has him spy on the building. A woman who is swarmed with death lines enters, confirming they found a den of the dead. Shiki uses his eyes to cut open the door, and confirms five of the dead inside. When they charge, he falls back on his killer instincts, slicing through them in a gruesome fashion. He's hardly in control, relying on the same violence that caused him to attack Arkawade at her condo. Arkawade merely watches from the shadows as he takes all five vampires down. She's impressed by his abilities, but tells him to put his glasses on between encounters, since it's possible to overuse his eyes. Shiki complies, but questions why she didn't bother helping in the fight. Essentially, she was testing him so she could see his eyes in action. Well, he's passed with flying colors, to the point where Arkawade invites him to join her even after she leaves town. He refuses, scolding her for even suggesting such a thing. With the den cleared, it's time for them to exit the building. On the outside, Arkawade trashes the place with a powerful swipe from her claws, destroying it in a single move. By reducing the building to a pile of rubble, she hopes to impress Shiki. Obviously, he's not enthused, and takes her by the hand to run away before anyone sees them at the scene. 
They escape just as a crowd begins to form around the wreckage. From 20 meters away, Ciel is observing the situation from above. She's already finished her share of the hunt for the night and is irritated to see Shiki back in the fray, beside a true ancestor no less. She addresses Mario, who stands behind her, appearing to float in midair. In truth, he's standing on several hundred marionette threads, the kind we saw back in Arcoade's route. He says he'll handle the cover-up as the acting priest in town, but wonders why someone from the burial agency would trust him, especially given his harsh treatment of Noelle. He almost seems hell-bent on antagonizing Ciel, but she doesn't budge. The more confident she is, the more threatened he gets. Their conversation here is essentially a battle of wills. Turns out, Ciel once worked with one of Mario's brothers, and as such, has respect for the Laurentis children. While Mario is a disappointment in comparison, she believes he will conduct his job properly, because ultimately, he'll act in accordance with his grandfather's wishes. Mario don't take kindly to this. He's pissed at that older brother, and does not appreciate the comparison. Regardless, he agrees to let Ciel act on her own authority, claiming she can go after Roa since he only cares about Roa's mage workshop. A convenient delegation considering he knows that Roa is already dead. He tries to leave, but Ciel has more to discuss. Taking control of the situation, she burns away all the threads Mario is standing on except one, threatening to torch the last if he refuses her. He questions if her flames were the result of her own innate magecraft or Vlav's idea blood. Either way, he's in no position to deny her request. It concerns Noelle and the fact that she was bitten by Vlav. There's a chance she can turn into a vampire, so Ciel wants Mario's team to investigate her body. He thinks it may be too early to care, but if it keeps Ciel off his back, it's worth doing. Mario distances himself, leaving her to sigh under the weight of all these events. Shiki and Arcoade arrive back at the park. He's exhausted from having to run so hard. She apologizes for being reckless. He says it'll be fine, so long as she considers his situation from now on before acting. She agrees, but he's not entirely convinced. Worse, however, is the fatigue from using his eyes too much. Arcoade explains more clearly the nature of his mystic eyes, that he's looking at the origin and end of all things. It's quite the burden for a mortal human to carry, so overusing this power can actually kill him. In practice, it means they'll have to be more careful and take more breaks from hunting the dead. Arcoade almost seems too cheerful during her lecture, and Shiki admits he likes seeing her that way. He can't stand seeing her get hurt like in earlier battles. Delighted, she charges him with a big smile, clasping his hands with hers. This adorable moment is halted when Shiki gets another massive headache. As he collapses from the sudden pain, Arcoade looks at him rather ominously. It's a brief moment that lasts only a couple of seconds, and she quickly returns to her usual cheerful demeanor. While resting, the two talk until midnight, after which they agree to continue their hunting tomorrow night. Shiki sneaks back into the mansion through the western entrance. Earlier in the day, he hoped to put all this vampire stuff behind him, but he can't just leave Arcoade alone. He tries to sleep, but when he closes his eyes, his thoughts just keep him hyper-focused. To pass some more time, he gets out of bed and starts to read a familiar book. As expected, it's another episode of Storytime with Roa, where Roa's memories of the past seem to flood into Shiki's mind. Turns out, Michael Roa Valdemiong was a mortal man born at the end of the 15th century. His family was wealthy, and he received a high-class education. As a healthy and diligent child, everyone respected him and hoped he would one day take over his family estate. Instead, Roa joined the church, seeking the house of God as a bastion of academic knowledge. During his years there, he met many different people, giving him admiration for humanity as a whole. He'd record and try to understand as many people as possible, but he eventually realized that his life would come to an end well before he could even cover all the people in his own city. His lust for truth and knowledge could never be sated within a single lifetime. All of the questions he had about the world would likely be answered far in the future, but he himself would never live to see that future. If he truly wanted infinite knowledge, he would need to exist eternally. The story suddenly shifts to after Rawa and his church colleague Narborek had established the burial agency together. The two discussed Rawa's plan to leave the burial agency and become a vampire. He could not complete his magecraft theory of eternal life as a mere human. 
Despite founding an organization of vampire hunters, he realized he needed to become a vampire. Thus, he handed over the burial agency to Narborek and prepared to visit the Millennium Castle Brunestud. Accepting this plan, Narborek declared that she would tell her descendants not to confront him over the next 100 years while he completed his research. Confident, Roa boasted it would only take 10 years to complete, if he could become the most powerful dead apostle of them all. And to do so, he just needed to be bitten by the most powerful true ancestor of them all. Hisui wakes Shiki up the next morning. She's worried because he's back to his usual fatigued self. His eyes still haven't recovered from last night's straining. She knows he was out too late, and was actually the one who left the side door unlocked for him. It's obvious that Shiki intends to sneak out again, so Hisui is concerned that he's putting himself in danger. He foolishly assures her that he'll be safe, since he's out with a strong friend, and that's enough to convince her to help out by leaving the door unlocked again. Confidant, level up! Shiki gets changed and goes to wash his face. After submerging his face in the sink, he looks into the mirror and hardly recognizes himself. In the sitting room, Akiha is in a pleasant mood. Shiki requests some regular tea, which Akiha says there's no such thing, letting Kohaku choose what to bring. While waiting, Shiki takes out his phone to check the news, which surprises Akiha, not because she banned his phone earlier, but because she didn't think he'd be suited to using technology so casually. He confesses he doesn't normally use his phone, and prefers to find things out more directly. Phones are convenient, but not a replacement for in-person conversation. Akiha agrees, mentioning that phone interactions are like letters, and that people only have to expose a part of themselves, which can lead to misunderstanding or deception. Shiki, to be fair, claims that it's hard to expose himself fully to others like that. He's not as transparent as, say, Arihiko. This makes Akiha say she's glad her brother has a friend like Arihiko, and suggests she meet him in person sometime. When it's time for her to head to school, she asks Shiki what he wants to do after school, whether he has any plans. When he admits he'll be heading home right after class, she feels bad because she won't be home until later. Regardless, the way she worded it makes Shiki realize he hasn't really considered his own feelings regarding all this vampire stuff. He's been acting on what he should do, not what he wants to do. Thus, he reflects on his relationship with Ciel and Arcoade. He doesn't want CL finding out about his partnership with Arcoade. Too bad she already does. Thus, when Shiki arrives to class, CL isn't at all pleased to see him. She was happily enjoying the morning with Arihiko, but the mood sours as Shiki approaches them. Arihiko asks if Shiki did anything to piss her off, neither of them aware of what CL knows. Stubbornly, she reasons she only came by to make sure Shiki's anemia wasn't acting up, otherwise giving him the cold shoulder. She cruelly asserts that she's talking to Arihiko, and that Shiki should go to the corner and reflect on his actions. To brighten the mood and hopefully set things right, Arihiko decides to reveal one of Shiki's weak points, the word game Shiritori. In exchange for forgiveness, Arihiko elaborates that playing Shiritori upsets Shiki so much, it makes him cry. He just can't stand the game, and feels disconnected from people when he plays it. Well, that explains why he refused to play with Arcoade during their date. Sure enough, hearing this cheers CL up, and she promises not to bring personal feelings into the classroom. During class, Shiki tries to pay attention, but his headaches intensify, causing him to pass out. He dreams about his past, as well as how crazy things have gotten since moving back into the mansion. Specifically, he basks in the time he killed Arcoade, lingering on each and every gruesome detail of her diced-up corpse. Suddenly, he takes the form of an insect, and the bloody pieces of meat and gore tower over him like buildings. He begins to tell himself that, even though Arcoade wound up reviving, he's still a murderer, an inhuman monster worse than a true ancestor ever could be. He wakes up in the school infirmary, unable to move until his blood flow improves. He listens in on the other side of the curtains, where Noel and CL are conversing about how vampires tend to cling to aspects of their old human life. It's a matter of sentimentality, and Noelle admits that she can relate, considering she still owns an old dress that she can no longer wear. The two think Shiki is in a critical condition, but once again he acts like it's no big deal, declaring he's awake to avoid eavesdropping on them. Noelle's glad he's okay, but Ciel is back to being cold and cruel. Of course, she's pissed that Shiki is still hunting vampires behind her back. Noelle, on the other hand, suggests they bring Shiki along to help with their own hunting. 
As expected, Ciel reprimands her for bringing it up, declaring that Shiki should have nothing to do with vampires anymore, and she'll punish those who go against that. Making herself abundantly clear, she leaves the infirmary. Feeling better, Shiki decides to get up out of bed. He could spend more time resting, but since he doesn't know when his anemia will strike next, he wants to be active while he still can. Noelle finds this attitude cute. She has a thing for guys who push themselves. Since he's going back to class, she decides to rest in his vacant bed for a while, complaining about cold symptoms. She sure is energetic, considering. Joking around, she says she's like Santa Claus and that her absence is giving her students the gift of a free study period. During lunch, Shiki spots Ciel in the courtyard on her way off campus. Suspecting she's off to visit another vampire den, he tries to follow her. Her pace is swift, making it hard for him to tail behind. He makes it to the station before she gives him the slip. Out of nowhere, she pops up behind him. I fear you're underestimating the sneakiness, sir. He tries to act all innocent, but ultimately confesses he came to see what she's up to. She informs him that, yes, she's investigating vampires, and that she wants him to go back to school immediately. Shiki defends himself, swearing he's not here for the vampires, but rather because he wants to be there for her as a person. It's not his fault her problems just happen to revolve around vampire hunting. Accepting this logic, CL allows Shiki to join her on her investigation, but scolds him for being so bad at following her. He's lucky to be alive, considering that Noelle or a vampire might instinctively kill someone on their tail so defenselessly. He promises to be more careful, and the two travel a ways until reaching an abandoned hospital, the same one he investigated on his own in the previous route. Even though there are no signs of vampires currently residing here, CL enters the building to make sure it's empty. Hospitals and their various facilities tend to make great hideouts for vampires, so she checks each and every room carefully while Shiki asks questions. Inquiring about their target, she states that she's on the hunt for Roa, unaware the guy's already dead. She presents Shiki with a hypothetical scenario. What if you went to see a horror movie, one in which the villain kills all the main characters by the end? As the credits roll, you look to the seat behind you and find that very same villain, having somehow escaped from the fictional world of the film. The villain tries to explain that his murders weren't actually his fault. They were just dictated by the script. Would you condemn the villain for his crimes, even though he only acted how someone else wrote him to? Before Shiki can give a serious answer, CL exclaims that she was just describing a movie she watched last night. The two agree to watch said film together, after the vampire case is resolved. Right. They eventually explore all the rooms on every floor without incident. Shiki's eager to leave, mentioning that he's not exactly thrilled about hospitals. CL jokes that, had they visited at night, she could have gotten to see his scared face. On their way back through the city, his stomach growls because he skipped lunch. She suggests they visit a restaurant she really enjoys. Considering this is a restaurant a girl enjoys, he thinks it'll be too expensive and tries to back out, but agrees when CL offers to treat her adorable kohai. She excitedly drags him through town, arriving at, you guessed it, a curry shop. The lunch hours have ended, and she's sad that they won't be serving spicy chicken, but seeing as how she visits this place a lot, she's accumulated enough points on her punch card for a free curry set. She hands the card to Shiki, recommending the mild butter chicken curry. She's tempted to order what's called the 10 times spice set, but settles for drinking chai tea since she's already had her lunch. Despite wanting to avoid eating four meals in a single day, she eyes his food with envy. When he offers to share some, she jumps on the opportunity, sucking down on a spoon before he can grab her a separate plate. While she's embarrassed, he finds it charming and offers her more, reminding her the food came from her hard-earned points. She digs in, and her smile alone makes it worthwhile. After eating, they stick around in the restaurant. CL asks Shiki why he's still interested in the case. Is he not scared because he has a method of killing the dead? He asserts that's not the issue. He is afraid, no matter how much strength he has, but he pushes himself anyway because he's inspired by her strong will and determination. After seeing her selflessly battle Vlav, he too wants to do whatever he can. The woman who saved him in the rain is trying so hard to protect the city, and he wants to show his appreciation by becoming stronger. CL jumps up, exclaiming that he has the wrong impression. She likes the way he is now, and wants to protect him. 
The two blush, going silent for about five minutes, until Shiki asks her about her fighting, whether she uses any kind of martial art. Humbly, she claims she just uses survival tactics and various methods that come in handy depending on the vampire. He praises her, saying that in comparison, all he's good at is seeing. She presses him more for details, prompting him to finally tell her about his mystic eyes of death perception. This is a huge deal, though he insists her skills are way more impressive. She clarifies that while her abilities can be replicated through technology, seeing death is something a human would typically never be able to achieve. When he kills someone with those eyes, it's a violation of physics, the law of conservation of matter and energy. It's nothing to take lightly. Anyway, the eyes certainly explain how he was able to fight Vlav, but then she asks how he got the eyes. She assumes they were genetically inherited from his father, and when he clarifies he got them seven years ago, after his accident, she acts like Gandalf did finding out about the ring. She stands up and explains that she has to research something. Before taking off, she insists Shiki refrain from hunting vampires on his own, pressuring him to make a promise. As a last-minute question, he asks whether vampires, or specifically true ancestors, can catch colds. CL explains that dead apostles don't have immune systems. As for true ancestors, any virus strong enough to trigger their immune system would be strong enough to wipe out humanity. Yikes. She wonders why he wants to know, and he says it's no big deal. The two part ways, happily promising to meet each other at school tomorrow. Speaking of, Shiki heads back to school, gets his things, and returns to the mansion for a peaceful evening. At night, he goes to visit Arcoade anyway, justifying his betrayal with the logic that, by being with her, he isn't technically going out on his own. Arcoade explains she has no specific destination in mind and will be relying on Shiki's eyes to spot the dead as they patrol the city, taking breaks as needed so he doesn't overwork himself. They probe almost every street and alleyway with no results, assuming the dead are all in hiding. Vampires have to drink blood, though, so they can only hide for so long that it's only a matter of time until their search bears fruit. For tonight, however, it's a bust. Even so, Arcoade admits she enjoyed wasting time and is beginning to appreciate otherwise useless experiences. The two return to the park, allowing Shiki the time needed to relax his eyes and brain. He too enjoys spending time with Arcoade and realizes he's not just spending time with her out of obligation. Concerned for her well-being, he asks how she feels, considering she sneezed last night. He wonders if she caught a cold. Just as CL explained, though, there's no way a true ancestor like Arcoade could have a cold. She teases him for worrying about her, but as soon as he mentions CL's name, she stops in her tracks. She throws another fit, acting like Shiki's been cheating on her. Now that Vlav and Roa are dead, he asks why the two girls still have to be bitter enemies. Sure, the church hunts vampires who prey upon humanity, but it shouldn't be a problem since Arcoade is a good vampire who doesn't suck blood. She admits it's less a problem with the church as a whole, and more an issue with CL specifically. In general, she's fine letting him do whatever he wants, but she won't forgive him if he falls for CL of all people. Shiki tries to explain that CL is a kind and reliable woman who saved his life, and argues Arcoade would get along if only they talked it out. Arcoade adamantly refuses, claiming that the burial agency is full of warmongers who can't be trusted. She puts him on the spot, forcing him to choose whom he's truly allied with, threatening to kill him if he picks CL. Regardless of Arcoade's threat, Shiki can't just forget about CL. He remembers all the things CL has done for him, all the things they do together. All the while, Arcoade butts in and insists that she does all those same things. Frustrated that he can't think straight, he tells her to shut up and let him answer. Putting it into words, he definitely has a deep appreciation and respect for CL, but at the same time, Arcoade is many times more difficult to ignore. It's extremely vague, but Arcoade interprets this as being very special to him. She swings back and shouts, her hands reaching for the sky. Then she apologizes for the outburst, saying she can overlook CL's existence in light of Shiki's words, and gleefully ends the night on a positive note. She proclaims that she'll be waiting for him tomorrow, many times more beautiful. This isn't exactly what Shiki meant, but it makes him blush regardless as she leaps away with glee. She's clearly subverted all his expectations about vampires, seeing her as far more human. While he still has energy, he heads back to the mansion. Meanwhile, in an ambiguous storehouse, Noelle has gathered 14 vampires, falsely promising them salvation. 
Instead, she begins to attack them, throwing the weight of her blade onto one of their skulls. With one of their comrades crushed in front of them, she asks why the others aren't scattering like spiders. To interrupt their shock, she slams her lance into another's head, splitting it open like a pumpkin. She's got them trapped and can whittle them down one by one. In a careless tone, she informs the surviving vampires that they are trapped within a barrier. There's no sense begging her to spare them, and the best they can hope for is to pray that God might miraculously save them. Without mercy, she begins to slaughter the vampires, most of whom are young adults and teenagers crying out as their flesh is scattered across the pavement. They shriek out in pain and terror, turned from hunters to the hunted by a single sadistic woman. Those that reach the barrier just wind up melting on contact, leading one vampire to call her a murderer. Noelle finds it hilarious that vermin like them could accuse anyone else of being a killer. She tears the vampire into ribbons, smiling as they apologize. When only five more remain, she resorts to torturing them. Like Gilles de Ray level shit, healing her victims so they survive as she nails their eyelids open, peels away their naked skin, and extracts their organs individually with black keys. Only when they beg for death does she move on to her next vile method, cracking their skulls open and pouring holy water into the open cavities. It burns them much like sulfuric acid, and she only lets one of them out of their misery after they've been reduced to a phonograph repeating the line, kill me. Once she's had her fun, she goes on to actually finish them off. One survivor tries to endure the barrier, melting away even for the slightest chance of escape, while another calls for their mother. A young boy swears that he hasn't killed anyone yet, but Noelle slays them all regardless. Taking a rest, she listens to the final survivor as he asks why she bothered to give them false hope. They were bound to starve on their own anyway. Even worse, why torture them? Shouldn't a human be more efficient rather than cruel? Noelle states it's common sense for the weak to fight those weaker than themselves. She's not doing this simply because they're vampires. She's doing it because she, too, is weak and needs easy prey to take her stress out on. God won't save such naive creatures, giving her all the reason she needs to slaughter them. With all the vampires mutilated, Noelle cleans up and tries to retire for the night, only to be caught by Mario in an alleyway. While she's great at dealing with threats weaker than herself, she panics in the face of anyone superior. She tries to justify her brutality by saying it'll help lure out Roa. Mario understands the concept, but it's clear she went overkill. Some of the victims hadn't even fully turned yet, and one of them was only helping the others as a human. Apparently, she's willing to kill anyone who so much as associates with vampires. In self-defense, she states it's not within his authority to judge, since the burial agency has separate jurisdiction. Of course, that would be the case, but Mario reveals that her direct superior, Ciel, has left her in his care. Now that he's actually Noelle's boss, he's not about to put his faith in a maniac like her. As soon as the case is closed, he'll be sending her to a convent, where they can investigate her conduct. Typically, convents or monasteries are isolated communities within the church. For those that choose to join them, it's considered righteous. But for those forced into such isolation, it's like torture. Noelle specifically suffered in that environment during her training and doesn't think she can return to such a life. Even worse, they'll be inspecting her body, which is obviously impure now that she's been bitten. Thus, she begs Mario to reconsider, claiming she's done nothing wrong in her service to the burial agency. Instead, he mocks her, claiming this isn't some kind of desk job. If she's not top tier, she doesn't belong. Hearing this, hatred swells in her, yet she swallows it knowing that even though she could kill him right now, she needs someone of his reputation to advance in the church. Even so, she tries to reason her way out by saying CL isn't trustworthy given her former history as a vampire. Taking Noel off the case would give CL unchallenged authority. Mario knows all about it, but explains that no matter what happens, it's CL's top priority to kill Roa. That won't change just because Noel's not around. The decision's already been made, and she should just pack her bags and wait for transfer. After Mario leaves the alley, Noel rages, slamming her weapon into a steel frame until it buckles. Normally, Noel can only use her lance by lightening its weight with magecraft. Here, she's just so angry she swings it with pure adrenaline until she's exhausted. She's desperate to devise a way out of this mess, but can barely think as she's struck with a nightmarish seizure. 
To endure the pain, chills, and nausea, she hunches over, clawing the ground with her fingers to avoid spasms. In this miserable state, she reasons her only salvation is to kill more vampires. Specifically, she aims to slay Roa in the next two days. If she does, God will surely reward her. After all, she spent the past 13 years trying to get her revenge, and neither Mario nor Ciel can stop her. In fact, I want to interject a bit and clarify that Noelle joined the burial agency for a very specific reason. A certain reincarnating dead apostle came to her hometown and killed everyone, leaving her the sole survivor. Wanting revenge, she worked her ass off to join the agency, only to wind up the pupil of that vampire's previous host. While Ciel isn't Roa anymore, Noelle still blames her just as much for what happened in the past. Thus, to have the very girl Noelle hates abandon her right when revenge is in reach, yeah, I can see why she's so pissed. It's really tragic, because as likable as Noelle is, she's severely damaged and is doing things that trauma can't really excuse. What do you guys think? Is there room for her redemption? Shiki arrives at the mansion and heads straight to bed. Again, however, he is compelled to do some more light reading. More story time with Roa! This memory takes place in 1989, the year I was born. Let's not beat around the bush. It's Ciel's past as a girl growing up in France. She lived happily, helping her father at his bakery and attending school until her 12th birthday, when she began to experience violent urges. Roa was taking over, causing her to want to strangle and stab her peers and townsfolk. These thoughts both delighted and frightened her. She bottled them up, living reclusively, until one day she snapped. A separate consciousness took over her body, using her to quench its thirst for blood. For the first time in months, she left her room, bringing smiles to her mother and father. As they rushed to welcome her, she killed them and chewed into their necks. Roa immediately recognized his new body was magnificent. He lacked the time to choose his body beforehand, and as a result he wound up as a girl from a humble family. She had no formal talents, but she was nonetheless overflowing with potential, her magic circuits being 100 times more potent than the average mage. In this form, Roa turned her city into his lair, influenced by her personality to be methodical and delicate in capturing the people. There was an elegance to their suffering that, while inefficient, was akin to Ciel's baking of sweets. She was captive to her own body, committing atrocities without the ability to resist. It was a nightmare to live as she played with the lives of people she once cherished. Her only salvation came when the true ancestor princess, Arcoade, arrived under a crimson moon. She fought with Roa and killed him, leaving Ciel's body behind as his soul fled to its next incarnation. Arcoade disappeared, and Ciel's body was taken away by the Vatican. Wow, so that got dark really fast. I assure you it only gets crazier from here. As you can see, this route is making much better use of all the new characters. To experience more, be sure to share this video on social media, as well as comment and give it a like. I can always use help with the algorithm. With that, I hope you look forward to the next installment. Before I go ahead and roll the credits, I want to give a vocal shout out to all my $10 plus supporters. Video Gamer 75, Samuel Gersten, Stephen Elak, Jens Bauman, RNG or Shuffles 1498, Josh, and SF Giants fan Mike. Thank you all so much. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this channel, help us grow by liking, commenting, sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of our anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. You can support us directly through Patreon, Subscribestar, or our YouTube membership, all of which come with benefits like exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate, celebrate your, your fandom! fandom.